are assembled in this place through Christ our Lord.
be with you. And with thy spirit. spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. against the Lord. And Nathan said, 
The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. When St. Paul says those words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, he's not just giving us a quippy little statement of how he lives his life. Scripture is not written for us to understand the way other people lived, then it would not be a necessity for it to be passed down. What it is is an example for us. And if St. Paul says, the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, it should give us pause to emulate him because everything in the scriptures are there for our example. We are supposed to live a life of faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. We love to stop at that loved us part. Everybody just wants to stop there because Jesus loved us. This is absolutely true. It's what you should carry with you at all times because it is the foundation and the source of our comfort. But it doesn't stop there. He loved us. He gave himself up for us. He proved to us how much he loved us. You know, it says in the scriptures that, I mean, even for a good man, one might consider to die. I mean, most of us would probably die for a family member, or we might die for a very, very close friend. God loved us so much that he actually took on our nature to be able to die for us. We might die for somebody because we're able to die, and we're going to eventually one way or another. So, you know, might as well die for a good cause, right? For somebody. Our Lord could not die. Notice I said didn't have to, could not die as God, as second person of the Trinity. The Blessed Virgin Mary had to give him flesh in order to die. That's the reason for the incarnation. We love the Christmas story that the Christmas story happened because he had to come here for Easter. He was born here so he could die here. That's how much he loved us. And when St. Paul said, I, the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The question posed is, do you love him? Do you love him in faith? you love him because he gave himself up for you. A lot of people say, you don't have to prove anything to God. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Never fall into that trap. You do have to prove things to God. That's why we have the examples of many, many people who prove their love for God. And it can be, a, well, I love God. I go to church on Sundays. We're going to get into that here in a second. Do you love a little? Or do you, do you love a lot? Well, it doesn't make any difference because Jesus loves everybody equally. No, he doesn't. No, he does not. He really, really appreciates when you demonstrate your love to him. It's got to start somewhere. And you know where it starts? It starts by understanding that we needed him to come and die for us. We kind of lose that whole, you know, we, yeah, we hear the Easter story. Why? Why was that necessary? Because we are sinners. We are not good enough to go into heaven. It doesn't matter if you were baptized, if you were confirmed, if you go to mass, even daily. If you don't truly love him, if you don't prove that love for him, then there is something wanting. There is something lacking. He loves when you demonstrate your love, but you have to understand why he had to love you. Unfortunately, in our day and age, you know, all we hear about is what swell guys we are. You know, from a lot of pulpits in our church, you know, all you nice people out there ought to do nice things for those nice people out there, and everything will be nice. Unfortunately, that's not the formula that we deal with. We, even in here, are all sinners. 
Let's not get prideful about this whole thing, okay? We just know it, or we should, because we should hear about it, that we are sinners. In our liturgy, every single time we get together, you know, the grievous sins that we have committed in thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We, can, we have three different confessions throughout our Mass. We want to let it be known in no uncertain terms before Almighty God that we understand that we are sinners and that we needed him to come and die for us. If you're a swell guy, you don't need deliverance. If you're a swell guy, you don't need mercy. You don't need forgiveness. And you do need it. You do. That's why we're here. That's why you should be here. The first reading today in 2 Samuel 12, we get someone who's confronted with the fact and they have to admit their sin. David, he's committed adultery and he's committed murder and he's confronted with it. Like how they confronted with it too. It, prior to where we started reading today, the prophet Nathan comes up and he gives him this parable about, you know, there was this guy and he had a bunch of sheep and there was another guy who only had one sheep and he stole that guy's one sheep and kept all his, what should happen to that guy? And David is incensed. He said, that man should surely die. Not, you know, he should surely die, but before you kill him, take all his stuff and give it to the guy he stole his sheep. And the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophet looks at David and says, you are that man. David thought all these things that he had done had been in secret. He knew they were wrong. He knew that it was wrong to take someone else's wife. He knew it was even worse to try to, or to actually kill her husband so he could have her as his wife. He knew that they were wrong, but he thought everything was a big secret. And he's confronted with it. He's called on the carpet. And for the first time in a long time in his life, he does something commendable. He doesn't make excuses about it. He doesn't go, well, you don't understand, Nathan. You know, Uriah's a soldier, and he wasn't paying enough attention to her. And, you, know, you know, I was just looking out for her, and things just got out of hand. It's a romance story. No, it's soul-destroying mortal sin. It's adultery. We have this tendency to do that, you know, particularly in our day and age. You call, you know, you, you call, you, most horrendous adulterous story you can think of, whether it's fiction or not. Well, that's a romance. No, it's not. It's horrific sin. Nothing romantic about it. Okay? Grievous sin. You know it's a sin. Admit it. It's not so much, yeah, the confession is a huge part of it, both in our own hearts and in the confessional, but it's admitting that you're wrong. Again, David, at least he had that going for him. He admitted that he was wrong. Admitted it. That is Psalm 50 or 51 if you use a newer version. We need to admit we're wrong. Whether it's knowing or unknowing. Like I said, those kind of sins that I'm talking about with David, he know they're wrong. They, you know they're wrong. Okay? We do things, and they're not generally horrendous and serious, that we do things that we know are wrong. It's usually running our mouths. I know I shouldn't say this to this person because it's going to cause problems, but they're going to hear what I have to say. Stuff like that. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. That is malice of forethought. We've got to admit it to ourselves. I should not have done that. That's where the confessional comes into it. But first, you've got to admit it in your own heart, or you won't go to the confessional. You've got to admit it, that you've done wrong. Knowing, knowing, known sins. The ones that are real dangerous are the unknown sins. Those are the ones that we get confronted with later on, and no matter how much information, all of a sudden we come to the realization we've sinned, we have to admit those also. You know, that's called great growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to know what he wants. You know, for instance, people on the outside, out in that horrible world of darkness and evil, and that's what it is, it's not a nice place, you're not gonna make it any better, it's horrendous, it's dark and evil. There are people out there who truly believe, who truly believe and actually go out of their way to try to prove that killing babies is somebody's choice, all right? 
or rank fornication. Oh, again, let's use a euphemism. Let's cover cohabitation. Everybody does it. Fornication, soul destroy, soul destroying mortal sin, separates you from the grace of Christ. You can live your life believing that in the world because that's what they believe. It's not relativism. That doesn't make it right. And once they know, they've got one of two choices. Either they have, I'm going to do it anyway, or I have to admit I'm wrong. Admitting you're wrong is called conversion. And we should pray with all our beings for that, for folks who believe such things. But both known and unknown sins, as we walk with our Lord, we should admit them. Once you admit them, once you understand why and should appreciate why Jesus Christ, the God-man, had to come and die for your sin, you, you, you have to respond. You have to prove that you understand that. You should want to prove that you understand that. The story of the woman in Luke let me stop there for a second. Before, you, can read that, you can read that story, and if you just do a cursory reading and just blow through it, you can actually come away from it thinking that you know, she was forgiven because she loved him so much. It's just the opposite. Her love is a sign rather than the cause of her forgiveness. She acted like she did because she knew the love that Jesus Christ had shown her. He did not forgive her because she loved him. She loved him because he forgave her. You get that, you, you, it, like I said, if you just do a cursory reading, because you can read that part about her and think, yeah, you know, well, it can be either or. It can't be either or if you look at the end part when our Lord says that the man who loved little is forgiven little. That puts it in context. There's actually one of the scripture versions, the Jerusalem Bible actually articulates it and translates it in a way that grasps that nuance. Is that, For this reason, I tell you that her sins, her many sins, must have been forgiven her, or she would not have shown such great love. It is the man who is forgiven little, who shows little love. That's the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The woman loved him as God, the Pharisee, who should have known better. The Pharisee who knows the law, the Pharisee who knows the prophets, has the stuff memorized. The Pharisee should have loved him as God because there was proof positive that he was the Messiah. The Pharisee didn't. Mary did. She loved him as God. The Pharisee did not. She loved him because she knew that she was forgiven. The Pharisee obviously was forgiven little. That, therefore, he loved little. That's what we need to understand. That's what we need to understand when we talk about our own life of faith. Do you love a little or do you love a lot? It, the first prayer in Mass today, the introit, the first prayer that we are sung today, every time you come to Mass, little footnote on this whole thing, when you come to Mass, every, for one thing you hear people, it's the same all the time. Stupid statement. I was going to try to color that up, but that's a stupid thing to say. Because if you're paying one iota of attention, every single time you come to Mass, if you come to daily Mass, the prayers differ. Okay? All the prayers differ. You're not paying attention. I didn't get anything out of it. Because you didn't put anything into it. All right? We have to understand that when we say things, collectively, even communally, you should mean them. Well, I'm saying this with everybody else. No, you should mean it too. And in our intro today, just partially, some of the words were, I am desolate. I am, not I was, or I might be. I am desolate and in tribulation. Look on my affliction. Forgive me. Those are people that would say that, that understand that since the last time we came through those doors, we've messed up. For most of us, just in a little way, but still messed up. Some of us, in a big way. So we should always be looking for this forgiveness, forgiveness but always appreciating the forgiveness. 
and I said before, criticized it, this everybody's swell thing. Uh, honestly, if you think you're okay, I'm okay with God. I don't do that many. I, I'm okay. You will love little. Can't help it. If you think you're okay, you will love little. You know, I love God enough. And let's, let's jump tracks a little bit and you get a little bit temporal about it. Because we talk about church and you talk about God. And it's like, yeah, some, you know, Sundays. Everyday life. Marriage. You know, even if you're not married, you know somebody who is. Because you're here. Somebody was married, or close to anyway. Marriage. How would any marriage pan out if one of the parties, or both of the parties, said, I love blank enough. We've been married a couple years. I love him this much. I'm, never, I'm not going to love him anymore. I'm going to try to increase the love for them. It's ridiculous. That's, that's stupid. Yeah, it is. Why do we treat God that way? I love him enough. I go to church on Sundays. Let's just leave it at that. I'm not uber Catholic. You should ever be growing in your faith because it's an experience. Just like a marriage is a relational experience between spouses, our relationship with God is even more so. Because marriage is till death do us part. God is for all eternity. We ought to be focusing on loving him like we're going to be with him for all eternity. We got to prove to him that we love him. We got to prove to him we love him a lot. One of the first pla one of the first places that that should manifest itself is guess where? In here at mass. Okay? The first thing you got at your rhetorical, don't want any spontaneous <laughs> statements. Why are you here? Why are you here? I mean, seriously, think about it. Did you ever really cognitively think? You know, I know some of you because my parents dragged me here. Why are you here? Because mommy and dad, even if you're an adult, you're out on your own. Well, it's, you know, my parents, it's a habit. Parents always went to mass on Sunday. Grandma and grandpa always went to mass on Sunday. It's just something I do. You should be here because you want to be here. We love people in this world. We want to be around them. Oh gosh, Sunday morning. Killing me. We would never treat somebody we loved in this world like that. I can't wait to get there. You know, you're traveling. You know, my parents live in Cincinnati. You, know, you, you get there a couple hours. You know, kids, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah. You want to get there. You want to be with them. You want to start doing things. Oh, gosh. Visit to the parents again. We would never treat anybody like that. Again, the marriage thing. Think about that one. Yeah. I talked to her on Sundays for an hour. See how far that will take you. Why are you here? And once you're here, and you should be here for the proper motive. If you are here, we ought not demonstrate that we love him. This is his time. You can pray any way you want. You can do anything for six other days a week and all the rest of the hours of Sunday. When you come in here, you should be here for him. Being here for him does not necessitate, and actually it would negate Talking to other people when you walk in the door. I'm preaching to the choir. I don't have to worry about this. But I visit a lot of places where I am scandalized as to, you know, like this is a social club. It's the golfing community. Let's everybody talk to it. I had a lady, <laughs> somebody come up to me a couple months ago. It's so disturbing. I try to press it. I mention it to Father. Mention the father. This is a big place too. There are other people, other places to go and talk, as opposed to right. Bring it up to father. Tell him you're trying to pray. See if he might put something out. That, you know, bunch of sorrow. About a month later, said, hey, did you ever talk? Yeah, I talked to father. He said that he likes when people talk before mass and after mass because it shows the vitality of the church. No, it doesn't. It's scandalous sin. 
it takes the focus completely off why you should be there. Go over in the parish hall, slap hands, hug one another, hold hands, jump up and down, whatever you want, that's for there. Not here. You know? And I'm not even going to start talking about how he's received body, blood, soul, and divinity. Different subject for a different day. How our Lord himself, in his very person, is denigrated, irreverently received. Can't harp on it enough. That's why we, you, the visitors, oh, man, it's kind of rigid in it. Rigid. I think you've had people say to me before, not any folks that are here regularly, if it, you know, I've had this. If this is golden presumption. You know, you don't smile when you're up there. Why would I? It's ridiculous. You ever listen? What's going on up there? There's no reason to smile. You're talking about someone who sent their only son to die for you. Can you imagine that? In this world, if somebody did that? Hey, I'm going to execute this person unless you give me your only begotten son, your only child. Okay, I'll give you my only child. Bang! Kills him. And you go into that guy's house with a big smile on your face, giggling and goofing around. I think you would be crushed with what he did for you. And you should act like it. That's the way we should act in here. But even in our daily lives, do you love little or do you love much? Prayer. Prayer is talking to God. Okay? I'm not really into the prayer thing. You know, I go to Mass on Sunday, but I'm just not into the prayer thing. Again, let's use the marriage thing. It keeps popping. But it, just, it just makes the point. So, but could you imagine that rationale? Again, I talk to her on Sundays for an hour. Really? You should be praying more now than you did three, five years ago because you have experienced Christ. You should pray to You should talk to Him more. The Bible... I'm just not into Bible reading. I'm not into Bible. I don't know how many people will tell me they're not into Bible reading. They read all other kind of stuff. I got e-readers. I got all kind of books. I read this. I read this history. I read this novel stuff. But I don't. Re I'm, I just can't get into Bible reading. That's God talking to you. Imagine the spouse talking to you and you going, I, 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 I. I don't. You know. I'm not into that listening to my spouse thing. Yeah, okay. Just thinking about him, contemplating him, meditating about him. I really don't think about God any of Sunday. I start thinking about him when I kind of get bent out of shape that I gotta to go to church and then I'm there and then I really don't think about it anymore. Okay. Think about people you love here. Do you not think about them constantly? You have pictures of them around. That's why we do what we do because we should prove our love to him because he loved us and gave himself for us not just because but because we're sinners and we have to understand that our relationship with God is a personal relationship it is not a church ritual it is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and if you have a personal relationship with him it will be one of experience it will be one of experience at and you will, you know, so the question that we'll end with, it's an experience. Are you actually experiencing a relationship with Christ or you were, are you going through churchy motions? The name of Father and Son and the Holy Ghost.
Let us pray for the whole state of Christ, church, and the world. Almighty, ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, Francis our Pope, Stephen our Bishop, His Holiness Benedict XVI, John the Bishop of Orlando, and all bishops and other sacred ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to thy holy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, which will be serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they would be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, to rejoicing in thy whole creation. They may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants to part with this life in thy faith and fear. We seek to need to be merciful and grant the fullness of joy in thy love and service, and to grant us grace and to follow the good examples of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our mediator and advocate, and with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and make your humble confession to Almighty God meekly kneeling upon your knees. Almighty God and Father, Father our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge you where thou art. Christ said to all who truly turn to him, Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul said, This is a true saying worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John said, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins.
the holy sacrifice of the Mass is offered this day with specific intention for Our Lady's intercession on the inaugural Mass of our potential church plant in the Lake Nona area. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be worthy of the promises of Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Brethren, that this my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable unto God the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of our hands, for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the Sanctify, O Lord, we beseech thee the oblations which we offer unto thee, and mercifully grant that they may be made unto us the body and blood of thine only begotten Son, who liveth and reigneth, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your Offering, 
that it may become for us the body and blood of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, the day before he suffered, took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes lifted up to heaven unto thee, God his Almighty Father, giving thanks to thee, he blessed, broke, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you.
sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb.
ministries may by their power be cleansed from all our iniquities and evermore be filled with the bounteous gifts of thy grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The peace of God and pass of all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. The Mass is ended. Depart in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord be with you. And with, with thy spirit. spirit. The Holy Gospel according to St. John the Divine. Glory be to thee, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And it was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. As a man sent from God, whose name was John, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and he beheld his glory, the glory of the only